Holmes Millet has been working with Haynes and Boone for many years now, and they've been creating their holiday card for quite some time. This was my second year actually working on one of these cards, and it's always a lot of fun to see what can be done uh, creatively and technically with one of these projects. Basically what they wanted was something that looked like it was cut out of paper that kind of took this magical voyage of a dove through kind of like this imaginary environment. The dove flies past the train set in a window and we enter this world with all of these cutouts that we created like mountains and snow. The train and people figure skating and a village full of people. Carolers and horse and carriage. Uh, then you reveal a living room at the end. You realize that the actual train that's going through this imaginary environment is actually a train that presumably was bought by um, uh, kid's parents for Christmas. For this project we used Cinema 4D and Octane Render Engine. Uh, there were a lot of technical challenges that we knew were going to be there from the get-go, like the sheer size of the scene to begin with, and we knew that we had to kind of keep that manageable and keep the poly count down while maintaining a great looking scene at the same time. So we wanted to avoid building these scenes too complex so that the scene would get too heavy and we'd have like millions upon millions of polys because we were under like a really, really strict deadline to get this thing done too. Like I think we had three and a half weeks to get the whole thing done. To start out, you know, we were, it was all pre-production for the most part. Dave and Lance really helped, you know, kind of power through the 3D aspect of it. Hollis began creating the hand-drawn storyboards and we used that for the animatic. We took all those storyboard images and just cut them up, put them straight onto the timeline, just built animatics based on that. One of the challenges was figuring out the layout of this imaginary world uh, in a way that it flowed so that the dove could really seamlessly make his way through it. Uh, so we actually had to sit down and map it all out. And we, we drew out this kind of map, almost like a treasure map on a, on a whiteboard and we figured out where's the lake going to be, where's the village going to be, where are the, the figure skaters, and the, where's the train go through the mountain. I figured the best way to map all of this out in Cinema 4D was to first sit down and just base it all off of the actual whiteboard drawing that we did uh, and build a big displacement map out of the whole thing. He emailed it to himself and he opened up the, the JPEG email and he just brought it into Photoshop and he built this like displacement map based on it. And then he took that displacement map into um, cinema and just manipulated it and just would like update and then go in and change the shading so he could get some of the hills taller and some of them shorter so there could be like variants. For the whiteboard concept, we created different numbers of elevations from zero to four or five. Zero being sea level, one and two being the smaller hills, the snow banks, and then three and four, all the way up to maybe even five, which was the mountain peaks in the background. It was just a really smart way of doing it. I didn't even think about it originally. I thought we were just gonna go in and like try and just like pull points and whatnot. Once the basic scene was set up with displacement, we could go in and start the actual animation and add the different individual elements. And you fly into the city and you kind of see the city and whatnot. And then there's this cars, traffic, bumper to bumper. We had to build this dove that's kind of like the the motivating device. Dave helped me um, design some, some different kind of ways to animate because we had to have the wings kind of have this fluidity that we could adjust on the fly because it takes all these kind of crazy dips and turns. We needed a custom solution for the Dove in order to easily keyframe these different components. So what we did was rigged it uh, with different pieces of espresso so that we could have an HUD with sliders set with limits so we could go straight into the viewport set those keyframes really fast and just keep on moving through our animation real quickly. Lance and I collaborated a lot on the different scenes. We both worked on different aspects of the animation, but in the end, I think I worked more on the overall landscape and the layout, things like that, the animation. Lance concentrated more on the art, the design, the different elements like characters and houses and trees and things like that. The modeling was kind of a complicated process. We had to we had to build things in an organic way that felt like, you know, things didn't meet evenly and things like, like you would if you handmade something out of paper or cardboard. One of the big things we had to keep into consideration was poly count, which was inevitably going to be very large. 
uh, we wanted to keep as much render instancing going on as possible so that the computer didn't have to do as many calculations when it came time to render. So things like the houses, they were created in chunks, garages, cars, modular bits that could be moved around or turned on and off. So when it came time to render, the computer only really had to calculate one house instead of 20. You'll notice the people in the carriage are also the parents, but they're just, we changed up their outfits a little bit. Like we put, you know, a stocking cap on the, the singers are also the same people too. So I had to take a couple of shortcuts. The same thing applied to some of the other elements like characters and of course the trees, which was a, a massive undertaking. So we built these trees, but they were very complex. And one tree alone, I think was like, 25,000 polys if you were to just like merge it all down. So what I did is I built just one little curly piece and then built a cloner around it and used that cloner to, to, to skew and kind of clone it outward and then built another row of cloners and then built another row of cloners. But I didn't use the instancing of the cloners because I knew we're gonna have to make thousands of these trees. And the way that Octane works, you can't like clone something within an, with, you can't instance something within an instance. So we built the tree so that it was like 25,000 polys. But then that 25,000 polys is all that the trees use within the entire scene. We had to build a court building specifically for the spot, like a clock tower, because they wanted to show like this passing of time. So I thought, if we're gonna use a court building, let's use the one from Back to the Future, because it's just, of any movie or anything inspirational that I can think of that involves a courtroom building, that's the one that I think of. And the one that I built is exactly like the one from Back to the Future. Once we had all the camera movements and uh, the dove locked in, we began the rendering process. And we started with rough renders and then we moved on to low sample renders in Octane. And then finally finished with the high resolution renders. Uh, once we were to the point where we knew that the keyframes were pretty much where they were gonna be and locked in, we took that 3D information and the rough renders together and sent them over to Joe who started working on the particle systems. There were two aspects of the particle system, and one is gonna be obviously the, the one you see you know, right in your face is the, all the particles flying off the dove, but the secondary particle system was to build this big volumetric snow box uh, the dove would be flying through. And for both of those systems, we used particular and after effects. The dove particle system was really the most time consuming of the whole thing. And, and that was working back and forth with David and Lance, and they would send out, um, you know, back and forth with some nulls. What, what ended up working really well was I got a null on each side of the wing that went, so that each time it flipped up, I could, I, I kind of created a slider that every time it went up like that, I could emit a few more particles. So that way it would, it would be like it was flipping off particles. It was like throwing off this gold dust as it flies through this atmosphere. Something that came up in the particle process is we didn't want sparkles coming right out of the back of the dove. If you're doing something like Tinkerbell, she's got feet, so when she flies, if particles come out the back, it's okay, they're coming out of her feet. But when you do this with a dove, it's a little different because particles coming right out the back of the dove kind of look like poo. We did not want it to look like poo. Actually, there was, there was a bit of a back and forth with, with the actual particles that came out. It, the, the original version had a lot more particles, actually. Having those particles fly off the wings looked a lot better. It was a little bit tougher for Joe because they were moving nulls that the particles had to come out of, but he got it all figured out and it looked great in the end. We finished the high resolution renders. I think we had like maybe four computers going at one point, each with dual 980 Ti graphics cards crunching away in Octane. And uh, once that was all said and done, we handed those renders back over to Joe again so he could start the color grading. I ended up finishing the whole thing in After Effects and doing, doing all the color correction and grading. What came out of Octane was looking really good, so I got very few passes, I requested very few passes to do the comp on this. Um, the, the only real point of contention was the, was the gold foil texture, and it's you know going back and forth with the client. We, we had a special pass for that so that I could adjust that in comp and, and kind of tweak that, because gold is always a weird color to kind of tweak. Everybody's got their personal preference on what gold should look like. Cinema 4D and After Effects just work so well together in this scenario because 
you can easily export all those 3D elements, all the 3D data. I was surprised at how well it integrated with After Effects in Cinema. You know, the guys sent out, put out a camera, I was able to bring it right in. The lights, the, uh, the camera moves, the external compositing tags, and it just seamlessly comes right into After Effects. It's pretty flawless. We had to do a lot of different things that we weren't too familiar with, but uh, the end product turned out pretty well. You always go into a project like this knowing that you're going to have technical challenges, especially if you've never done certain aspects of it before. Uh, there's always going to be something new that you've never done. Uh, it's tough. It's, it's brain straining at times. Uh, it's long hours, but that's part of the fun of it. It's kind of like a puzzle. And when you're, when you're working with such a great team and such intuitive tools, you know that once you're done, you're going to deliver a really great looking product. <laughs>